Welcome. This is Craig Applegath, and this is the 21st Century Imperative Podcast, the podcast series that explores the insights and approaches of scientists, designers, planners, engineers, business entrepreneurs, and other successful change makers who are finding effective ways to meet the three critical challenges posed by the 21st Century Imperative. These are how will we continue to live on our planet without destroying our biosphere? How will we repair and regenerate the environmental damage we have already caused? And how will we adapt to the escalating impacts of climate change? Each episode will feature an interview with an individual whom I think you will find not only inspiring, but also very relevant to helping you answer the question, what can I do to meet the challenges of the 21st century imperative? My guest today is Ben Gibbons. Ben is the founder and managing partner of Waterpoint Lane, a venture capital firm focused on investing in growth stage companies centered in primary production, technology and services, and consumer products that promote sustainable practices throughout our food system. Ben grew up on his family's sheep and wheat farm in central New South Wales, Australia. In 2019, Ben reestablished his connection with the land and the sustainability of our food supply with his founding of the venture capital firm Waterpoint Lane. And Ben tells me that Waterpoint Lane was the name of the road leading up to the family farm. Ben spent the previous 15 years plus of his career in investment banking and consulting to support growth stage and middle market companies with extensive experience across mergers and acquisitions, debt, equity, and alternative capital financing transactions. Through Waterpoint Lane, Ben sees significant opportunity to drive change in the way we think about our food system, change that contributes to climate solutions, and secures a lasting and sustainable legacy for our children. In our conversation, Ben and I talk about the really big challenges facing the world in creating and maintaining a sustainable food system in the face of escalating climate change impacts, the most promising policies, strategies, and technologies for helping us reduce the environmental harm we are causing, the huge challenge of food security and sustainable food supply in the face of climate impacts, and what advice Ben would offer listeners about what they can do to be part of making a difference in meeting the challenges of the 21st century imperative and maintaining hope. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Ben, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Craig. Very happy to be here. In the introduction, I provided our listeners with a brief biography of your career to date. Clearly, you're really passionate about sustainability and sustainable food production. Why don't we start off with you talking about how you became interested in sustainability and sustainable agriculture and food systems and how it grew to become your career? Yeah, absolutely. I think what's what's interesting is it, it feels a lot like I'm actually come back to my roots with what I'm doing with, with Waterpoint Lane now. I actually grew up on a farm in New South Wales, about six or seven hours west of Sydney. We grew sheep and wheat predominantly on our farm, but um, my father was always adamant that uh, my brother and I were not going to be farmers. So uh, I, uh, I ended up in Sydney for university. When I finished high school, I, I uh, studied engineering at, at school, funnily enough. Um, so you know, a lot of uh, a lot of permutations to my career that we'll kind of get through you know, quickly uh, kind of graduated from from engineering at, at university, but definitely uh, decided that engineering wasn't going to be a career of choice and ended up in, uh, in investment banking. So, you know, worked for some large investment banking firms in Sydney, uh, learned a, a ton of information, but uh, got an opportunity to work with a small entrepreneurial company at one point and definitely saw working with more small mid-market entrepreneurial companies as, as something that was a lot more interesting to me. So, Started working with with those companies again, you know, in that kind of growth capital uh, mergers and acquisitions world, and and had a ton of fun doing it. Uh, I was relatively industry diversified at that point in time. That's where I happened to meet uh, my now wife. Uh, she's Canadian. She grew up uh, in Edmonton originally, but she uh, she was uh, living and working in Sydney as well. And uh, met her there. She flew back to Canada. Um, her family had all moved to Toronto, so I always say I'm I'm kind of relatively glad she didn't make me move to Edmonton, but. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I ended up following her. <laughs> I won't comment on that. <laughs> uh, I ended up following her back across to Toronto here and uh, started working in the same field, um, mergers and acquisitions with with kind of smaller, uh, more entrepreneurial companies. Again, you know, diversified companies, but got to a point where I think I was kind of reassessing what was important to me. And you know, a couple of life events happened, I guess, as much as anything that uh, helped me 
me focus that. First off, I had a, had a daughter. Um, she's now two and a half years old. I think having a child obviously kind of helps you think about uh, one, what's important yes, to you, but yes. two, uh, you know, definitely started thinking about the fact that we, we were responsible for this uh, this new human and, and had to feed her. And so it started going down a bit of a rabbit hole as much as anything at that point in time about, you know, you know what we're going to feed our daughter. And that's what got me a lot more kind of re-engaged, I think, with our food system, um, you know, where our food was coming from and you know, spent way too much time on, on documentaries and, and reading uh, stories around uh, our food system and, and re-educating myself as much as anything. You know, obviously, COVID came along and, and kind of you know, forced a lot of us to, to rethink about what was obviously important to us. And that's where the uh, the idea of, of kind of Water Point Lane was born. So I finished up my um, my career with the, the firm that I was working at in July of, of 2021 and and launched Waterpoint Lane in, in August and uh, yeah, haven't, haven't looked back. Wow, since. what a time to launch. R- right into the teeth of COVID. <laughs> yeah, well, which teeth of COVID, right? Like we've gone through so many ways. Yeah. I was actually talking to uh, to a colleague and said, launching something at the peak of a COVID wave is probably the right <laughs> the right time because by the time you've, you've kind of got to a point that you were, were back at the trough again. You didn't go into farming, but you sort of went into farming. You went into supporting people doing farming. So a sort of full circle, almost sort of <laughs> yeah. drawn back to, to the farm. Full circle and, and kind of back to the roots. And I think you know, definitely it was something that I'd never lost passion for, I guess, a- along the way. You know, every time you know, I kind of look back on my career um, in, in kind of just more diversified investment banking and, and any time there was a agricultural or kind of food related company, you know, I, I definitely found myself kind of gravitating towards those deals. So, you know, felt like a little bit of a natural progression at the end of the day. So Ben, one of the reasons I wanted to talk to you is because sustainable food systems are really important, but one of the big questions is how to scale them. But before we dive into that, I think many of our listeners are probably wondering, how do you define sustainable food system and what kind of themes are important to you in in this definition well the the big challenge is i don't think there's a clear definition of a sustainable food system i think that's that's probably the biggest challenge that uh, you know anyone in in this space deals with and i and i i definitely believe it's an aspirational goal as opposed to a an end state that uh you know we're ever going to kind of get to but i think benchmark yeah philosophically as much as anything probably it's around alignment of ecological social and and economic goals that can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people obviously as a result of that i focus on kind of some some kind of key uh, guiding principles around sustainability of our food um the, the the first one is around a focus on soil and and improving our soil health um as a as a key fundamental aspect to to um, sustainability of our food and uh, the second one is around uh, of animals that you know are, are important parts of our food system to this day, improving access and, and quality of, of water, and then you, you kind of start to get a little bit kind of further down the supply chain. You know, our farmers and, and farm workers and, and ensuring that they um, you know have kind of livable wages, and then ensuring that we have a healthy and sustainable produced food for all of our communities and affordable food in particular, which uh, I'm sure is a topic that we can kind of dive into. And then the, the last piece of it around like the use of, of energy and the discharge of waste throughout that and, and minimising that, ensuring that we um, you kind of feed that back into the into the system where we can through recycling and upcycling opportunities. So, yeah, there's a lot of factors, obviously, that I kind of I ran through there and um, how they all interrelate and get to a, a point where we have a sustainable food system, I think is you know, obviously a challenge, but a challenge that we, we obviously need to meet head on. So expand on, on the challenge aspect of what, what are the really big challenges facing our world and creating and maintaining a sustainable food system? I mean, it, it's especially in the context of a climate change and the impacts of climate change. Yeah, for sure. I, I think it, it, it really does boil down to this this narrative that I'm, I'm sure – you know, you and a lot of the listeners have heard around this goal that we have to have to feed 10 million people by by 2050. Yep. The narrative around that goal and that milestone is, you know, has changed a lot over over the years. You know, that that I've been kind of focused on it, but certainly even before that, yeah, 
I see a large part of our, you know, what I would call our kind of traditional industrial ag system requiring that narrative to be focusing on increasing farmland, you know, better, more efficient fertilizers, you know, increasing scale, you know, as much as anything. You you do have to acknowledge that there's been a lot of capital invested in, in um, industrial ag uh, to date. And so to make movements in that system, we have to be mindful of, of kind of how, how to repurpose Yeah, that vested capital. interest in lock-in. Yeah, I think we do need to kind of think about how to repurpose that and, and certainly focusing on ensuring that we're not you know, continually clearing you know, other vegetated land for agriculture, particularly in, in you know, some of our you know, more protected areas. But we can you know, kind of leverage a ton of opportunities, obviously, to, to meet that challenge of, of kind of feeding 10 billion people by, by 2050 through you know, technology and services that improve you know, the economics of, of kind of more sustainable, regenerative type farming practices, you know, reducing food waste throughout that supply chain. So you know, more of the food that is already grown hits the, the, the plate of a consumer. And, and then, as I mentioned before, like increasing the access and affordability of sustainably sourced products to all communities. I think those are the, the kind of key fundamental uh, opportunities that can allow us to achieve that without... Um, using um, ag as the uh, problem in the climate change story. Right. And so maybe expand a bit about some of the promising policies or strategies and technologies that are going to help us reduce environmental harm we're causing, especially related to ag. So I, th- I think um, up and down the, f- the supply chain, there's, there's a ton of interesting things that are happening and, and have happened Policy is always is always an interesting topic for, from my perspective. I think um, policy is helpful in a lot of respects, but we can't rely on on kind of policy and regulation to get us to where we need to get to. It's an enabler. It helps frame and, and it's a context. contextualize a lot of the time. Um, but you know, there are some 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 great policies and, and funding uh, opportunities that have been enacted by by various governments over time. One that is current that I actually am quite supportive and excited about is. There's a on-farm climate action fund that supports farmers in adopting beneficial management practices related to climate change and, and you know, storing carbon, reducing greenhouse gases, particularly in, in kind of regenerative agricultural practices like cover cropping and rotational grazing practices. So as long as the, you know, that capital can get utilised in the right fashion, I think those policies are very important and help you know, help innovation occur in, in the sector because you know, with, with you know, government funding opportunities – the adoption curve can sometimes be reduced for people at the production level, which has often been the problem with, with ag tech adoption uh, historically and the challenge that has been faced in, in innovation in, in the space. I would be a, a big proponent for increasing funding levels to um, the organisations that do support these types of initiatives. Um, that policy that I mentioned in particular was was led by a group called Farmers for Climate Solutions and yeah, that, they've been great champions. Where, where was that based? They're based here in, in Ontario. In Ontario, locally. And then, you know, as, as I mentioned, like the technology side of that, there's a lot of interesting companies that are doing some some great things on, on the technology side to help support farmers with their uh, sustainable farming practices. And, you know, I could probably talk for, for two hours on all the different types of technologies. Is there anything that really stands out or that really is really interests you right now? I'll tell you about the one that I'm quite excited about at the moment. Um, that would be a good one. <laughs> it's it's a it's a US company, but you know they have global application, um, and and we're working with them here in in Canada. They've perfected a technology around the inoculation of live um, native microalgae that can they they extract out of a of a farmer's soil, uh, inoculate it in a in a system that they've developed and re- reintroduce it in in greater quantities through a. Through a managed uh, solution on onto a, a um, through a farmer's irrigation system. So, so sorry, are they are they inoculating the algae themselves, or is the algae what is used to inoculate the system? They they take the the algae out of a farm soil, and yeah. then they they inoculate it in a lab, and then reintroduce it back into the farm soil. And then because it's live, it it continues yeah. to grow and inoculate within the soil itself as well. What are they inoculating it with? Uh, yes, just some existing uh, kind of chemicals and uh, inoculants that they, they kind of access. And, and then what does it do in the soil? Does it break down or produce or generate? Yeah, um, it, it continues to grow and, or, and increase yeah. the organic matter within the soil itself. And so, you know, ultimately you're, you're increasing the, the, 
the, the organic matter within the soil, you increase uh, water retention within that soil, you improve that soil's ability to uh, hold you know, nitrogen and phosphorus and, yeah. and, and potassium, obviously, you're all kind of key elements for, for, for plant growth, et cetera. And so in, in testing, they've, they've managed to um, some, get some great outcomes in terms of increased yield for a farmer, um, but also, um, and probably as importantly as anything, reducing the inputs that are required to a farm. So you know, less fertiliser requirements, less water requirements, et cetera, over time. What are some of the most important lessons you've learned from your work in your role as a managing partner of Waterpoint Lane about how to both increase awareness of the key issues related to climate change and its impacts on our food system and how we can best adapt to them? For sure. Before before we do kind of just jump into that, I just want to kind of just kind of touch a little bit further down the the supply chain too, just on your previous question there. So that's some like interesting stuff that's happening at production level. Uh, yeah, as we kind of move down the supply chain, there's some great efforts being made in that waste reduction side of the equation. And I, and I think there's importantly around this kind of upcycling and recycling uh, opportunity, you know, reducing food waste throughout the supply chain. I'm not sure if you, you've heard the stats, but oh yeah, it's upwards yeah. of anywhere – to like fifty eight percent of our food is lost. Throughout yeah, I'd heard something like thirty to sixty percent, depending on the, the situation. <laughs> right. And this is all, all along the supply chain. Yeah, this kind of starts at the farm yeah. gate. It kind of goes all the way to yeah. consumers. Consumers are probably the worst. Yeah. Well, there's that that whole concept of pretty food, right? Right. Where the grocers will, if it, something looks like it's got a little mark on it or something, they'll just toss it because they know people won't buy it. Right. And isn't there? And there's now an ugly food movement. That's like right. buy ugly food. But if it's not out, how do you buy the ugly food? But anyway. Right. But, but there's some, <laughs> some great companies that are doing some, yeah. some cool things in terms of taking that, to your, your point, that, that ugly food that you know, doesn't make it to our shelves and, and repurposing it. A company called Outcast Foods. Um, they, oh, that's a great name. Yeah. So they're a, um, you know, a sustainable food tech innovator. They've partnered with a number of companies to take you know, their product and, and repurpose it for better usage in lots of different types of products. Um, there's a company out of Montreal called Loop Mission that does the same thing in, in the juice market, et cetera, and kind of taking your know, waste product there and, and putting into the juices that you and I would, would actually drink. So, Well, it doesn't matter what it looks like on the outside when you're juicing it. Well, yeah, right? well, once, once you've like, juiced Like, it, who cares? Yeah. That's right. And then the really big opportunity, I think, that we are seeing for consumers at the moment is this concept of transparency and traceability of our food. Mm. Consumers are at this stage now where – they're demanding more more access to information with where their food is coming from. And it started off being a, a bit of a niche, but it's certainly kind of grown over time to be something that is becoming a lot more prevalent. Coincidentally, Cargill just actually released a report on, on food packaging and highlighted that you know, consumers are more likely to purchase a packaged item with a sustainability claim on it. Now, I won't go down the rabbit hole of food packaging and, and claims that are made on, on food packaging and, and how, how right or wrong they are, but Standards will, will kind of catch up in, in this regard, but I think the opportunity for consumers will be in, in kind of getting true transparency and related to their ingredients and, and the technology that we're seeing in terms of traceability, I think is, is going to be something that's uh, hugely important going forward. For sure. Yeah, that's really interesting because I know in a parallel world of mass timber, there's discussions about how to prove that the mass timber you're getting on site is actually coming from sustainably harvested timber in the forest. And so some of, some of the opportunities are the use of blockchain yep. um, for chain of custody um, and also DNA testing. Right. Now, that may be down the road, but it strikes me that all those things could be used for produce as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, there's been a long conversation around kind of blockchain usage in the food industry for traceability purposes. But the fundamental idea of traceability as well, I think, is you knowing where your food comes from. And, you know, localization of food and the, the movement towards you know, more localization of food, I think, has probably gained a little bit more traction as, as supply chain issues through COVID uh, have, have obviously kind of popped up. So what we're seeing with urban and vertical farming projects that I know you've kind of discussed on this program in the past, et cetera, as well as QR codes right. and direct farmer to, to, to consumer models that have kind of become a lot more prevalent in, in North America as well. You know, all these issues that just allow consumers to say, 
all right, I, I've got a good handle on, on where my food comes from and how it's sourced, and therefore I, I feel comfortable eating it. So back to the question of important lessons learned. You're mm. the managing partner of Water Point Lane, and it's a venture capital firm looking to invest and move forward sustainable food systems of various types. What are some of the key lessons you've learned in being a venture capitalist in that space? Well, I, I think the, the, the biggest lesson, and I think this point gets lost too many times in conversations, is that our food system is very complex. And there's a lot of significantly interrelated parts to our food system. And to some degree, to our conversation, like, there's no magic bullet that's going to improve sustainability across the system. This is a process of ongoing and incremental change. And there's no end state. So you know, we're going to keep making improvements over time. And everyone throughout the supply chain can make small incremental steps that will make large improvements over time. And I, we're not going to see a, a fundamental change as these, what I call the kind of micro steps occur over, over periods of time, they collectively kind of add up. And as the supply chain continues to keep pace with itself, I think we'll see some of these opportunities occur. And you know, some of the concepts in food sustainability do cause some polarizing views. You know, I'll use the term regenerative agriculture, ultimately focusing on we need our soil to be better than what it is today yeah. in a lot of markets. And and large CPG companies have made commitments to sourcing from farmers practicing regenerative agriculture, but it's not a clearly defined practice. So, you know, what is regenerative agriculture? Like no one necessarily agrees on a on a specific definition on that point. And and so but at least there's a pressure moving people in the direction. So there there may be some various points of view, but at some point they'll coalesce. Yeah. And yeah, there's probably smarter people than me that are kind of th- they're trying to figure out what, a, what an appropriate standard in this space is. But yeah, but you make it happen because you supply the, the investment. Well, that's right. Like, you know, if, <laughs> if, if we, and, and that's the thesis ultimately of, of Water Point Lane to, to what you said, if, if we, if we can direct capital, because I, I think that the one fundamental point is there is a lot of capital in the market. And so if we can direct that capital to making improvements in sustainability in food, which has a ton of beneficial effects from climate change through to health, then I think we're, we're kind of directing capital to do the right thing. And there's been you know, just a general fundamental movement from institutional investors all the way down to, to family office investors that they want their capital to be doing more than just generating an economic return. They want it to generate socioeconomic returns along the way as well. Yeah. And when, when we first talked, you said a number of your investors were seeking you out because they had decided that this is one of the things they wanted their money to do. It wasn't just random, that there are people out there realizing this is really important and then looking for ways to invest in, in change. Yeah. Most of my investors are kind of larger family offices that have made money doing various business ventures over the years. And a lot of them are at that pivot point between first and second generations as well. And and generally, what we've seen in, in the family office space in particular is we kind of go from first generation that made their money in business X and generation two wants to make their stamp in the world. This is a way that they can kind of make their stamp because they're now stewards of that family's wealth. And so their ability to generate economic returns while doing good is, is a significant opportunity on their behalf. Just shifting gears a bit, in just about every industry I've been talking with over the last couple of years, they've talked about being impacted for or leveraging big data and potentially down the road, artificial intelligence, now machine learning. Mm-hmm. Any really interesting opportunities for food sustainability and sustainable ag? Yeah, well, I, th- I think we kind of touched on a little bit earlier with respect to transparency in our food supply chain. You know, that's a big area of focus and AI and big data in, in kind of manufacturing of, of our food to help monitor every stage of that process can kind of help make sure that we're kind of producing the right quantities, directing it to where it needs to go, et cetera, for sure. But I think at the agricultural level in particular, the amount of data that is now being captured, smart sensors, drones, you know, real-time video streaming between farms and ag experts to get better information from an input and, and yield perspective – We're at that stage now where it's possible to combine all these in-ground sensor data, measuring moisture and fertilizer and nutrient levels, analyzing that with kind of growth patterns and and kind of weather forecasts and and using 
all that data to really optimize crop yield over time. And so you, know, you combine that with the technologies kind of like we mentioned before with my land, I think you're at that stage where farmers have more access to information than they uh, probably could ever dream about having access to and, and how they leverage that and use that to improve crop health and, and crop yields, I think is, is a super important opportunity. So farmers now have to be biologists, economists, and computer scientists at the same time to, to be effective. Wow. Well, you know, without kind of being overly facetious about it, we're, we're at the stage now where, you know, if a farmer so chose to desire, he could probably sit at his laptop and manage, you know, 90% of, of what he needs to manage. Well, I've, se- I've seen uh, videos of prairie farmers in Canada and United States sitting in their giant harvesters or combines, and they've got a computer at the wheel, and they're staring, but they're also looking at all the data coming in. I'm like, whoa, this is, this is transformed. Yeah, and, and, and we're at the stage now where, where you know, we've seen autonomous cars, autonomous trucks. We've got autonomous combine harvesters coming out from John Deere and, and others, et cetera, as well. So I remember... 30 odd years ago, you know, sitting in a, in a combine harvester with my dad at like nine o'clock at night, because that's kind of what, what they did. Is this when you said, I'm not going to do this? Yeah, this this is when I was saying, I'm not going to do this. And when he was saying, they're not going to do this either. Cause like, <laughs> yeah. he, he would have much rather be sitting on the couch, I'm sure at home with a cup of tea in his yeah. hand, like <laughs> yeah. letting the combine harvester do its thing for sure. I hope you're enjoying this episode of the 21st Century Imperative Podcast. We've certainly enjoyed producing it. As you know, 21st Century is a not-for-profit venture, but we still have production costs. So to help cover these costs, we've launched a new online store with all proceeds going to cover production. And we have some great products for you. We have organic, fair trade t-shirts and hoodies, as well as non-toxic, BPA-free coffee containers, all with great graphics. So if you like the podcast, please think about helping us out by buying a t-shirt, hoodie, or mug for you and one for each of your friends. Head over to our website at tfcipodcast.com and click on the 21st Century Store button. One of the things that this also raises is the question of scale. Can we do this new sustainable agriculture at a smaller scale? Like when I was a kid, you drive up through Ontario and the farms were family farms. There was a, a family that was basically doing all the work along with the tractor, the kids and the, the even grandparents. And now they're tending to disappear and they're becoming larger in scale. Is there going to be potential for large farms and small farms? Do you, do you have a sense of where that's going by any chance? Yeah, I, I, I think we, we've, we've kind of ridden the crest and we're coming back down with respect to scale being the answer to our farming uh, needs. And so I think we went to a point with industrial ag where scale was king. Now we've kind of come back out the other side of it and said, well, scale isn't necessarily the be-all and end-all. And so we are seeing an increase in proliferation of kind of small-scale farming operations, projects like you know vertical farming and urban farming operations that – increase the localization of our food and therefore can be done in, in smaller and more dense locations, I think is definitely a, a feature. And then there's a whole obviously kind of movement towards cell-based and lab-grown meats. And in certain geographies, you know, that's potentially going to be a hugely important opportunity. Places like Singapore, who are one of the world leaders in this space. Landlocked and they don't have any agricultural land. They have no yeah. space. And so their ability to kind of grow their own meat product and not have to rely on supply chains from a global basis can be hugely important to, to those types of markets. Who are some of the thinkers on sustainability and, and sustainable agriculture that you particularly admire and what kind of key insights resonate with you? So I would say, firstly, the, the original thinkers on sustainability are the Indigenous people of, of our lands. They were the original custodians and teachers of how you know, we should live in harmony with our land. And, and they managed truly sustainable food systems for thousands of years before uh, us obviously kind of got involved. So some of their, their lessons and, and their teachings, I think, are hugely important for us to kind of keep in mind. And the one that certainly does resonate a lot with me is the dish with one spoon law. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure how familiar you or the listeners are, but yeah, ultimately it's a belief where the dish represents the land 
and you know needs to be shared peacefully. The spoon represents the individuals living on it, and and the resources of the land in in kind of a, a, a mutual cooperation. So we have to share the responsibility of ensuring that the dish is never empty, and that includes taking care of the land and the creatures that we share with it. So I, I think if if yeah, without being overly philosophical about it, if if we actually listen to that philosophy and it can apply in you know so many different kind of facets and opportunities i think there's a lot to be learned in that regard in terms of some of the more contemporary people in in the sustainability space in food some some of your listeners may have seen a, a netflix documentary titled uh, kiss the ground yeah kind of relatively popular a, a few years ago Dr. Chris Nichols was featured in that. She's a, a leader in the movement for regenerative soil and healthy soil. So she, she's someone that I definitely uh, have, a, have a lot of time for and, and her thesis on our soils obviously uh, are significantly important for our planet on a go-forward basis is, is something um, that I certainly subscribe to. And for those that haven't seen that documentary, certainly highly recommend it. The other is a gentleman by the name of Charles Massey, he was a farmer in Australia, turned scientist, went back to school after kind of middle ages, um, did his PhD and became an author. He wrote a book called Paul of the Reed Warbler, which is around regenerative agriculture and the, the ability to kind of create sustainable farming systems in a lot of different parts of the world. And he, he kind of talks through a lot of the history around holistic farm management in areas like South Africa, Australia uh, and North America. It was one of the earlier books that I read in this space and helped me to kind of re-educate myself on kind of our food and ag system and frame my thinking on on how regenerative agriculture can be an important component to this process on a go-forward basis. Yes, and going back to your comments on Indigenous agriculture, I'm just finishing Robin Wall Kimmerer's book, Braiding Sweetgrass. Right. And one of the most lovely sort of ideas in it is this notion of reciprocity, that as an indigenous person, you're not other, you're embedded. And it's your responsibility to take care right. of the environment that you're part of. You're not separate from it, you're in it and you have responsibility. So that when you go harvest rice, you harvest at most half the rice. Right. So the other rice can seed the lake or the paddy. Yeah. It's very effective. I mean, ecologically, I mean, it makes a lot of sense, but it also is a lovely philosophy of understanding that you are completely embedded and anything that you do will, could either have positive or negative consequences. Lots of lessons to be learned. I'm not sure whether or not they will be, but let's hope. Um, yeah, but, but yeah, th those are interesting concepts as well. And, and we've seen like you know, these little increases in, in you know, microcosms of small movements of, of things like food foraging and yes. and you know, taking those those concepts along the, the way where you, know, you come across a, a mushroom patch. You don't take 100% of the mushrooms that you find. You take 50%. And, yeah. and you know, that's the whole concept of kind of sustainable food foraging. And so, again, like these concepts can be small sometimes, but as they grow and, and become a lot more pervasive, then they can be impactful for sure. In terms of your actual role as an investor, what are some of the companies that you've partnered with to date and what drew you to them and and how are they impacting the food system? Can you talk a bit about that? Yeah, for sure. So the overall mission of Waterpoint Lane is is to move the needle on sustainability and food system. I kind of break that down into kind of three core functional areas and I've been lucky enough to actually find an investment in all three. So I'll kind of you know, kind of touch on one and then the investment that I made. So the first one is kind of mentioned a couple of times, this increase in adoption of regenerative agricultural practices. So MyLand was the, the company that we've invested in today in that space. So uh, again, that's that soil health company delivering live native microalgae to increase the, the organic matter within a soil and ultimately uh, improve soil health over time. The second area is the reduction of food waste throughout the supply chain. The investment that we made in that is a company out of Calgary called Provision Analytics. They're a food safety and compliance software company. They're digitizing a, a very outdated paper-based system in, in that vertical. And the opportunity to reduce food waste with more targeted, quicker recall processes as, as a, like one example benefit is an outcome and mission that they're trying to move the needle on. The third investment is, which ultimately was kind of the, the first investment we made is in this concept of, of kind of more sustainably grown food products at the consumer level. And 
the company that we invested in there is a company called Holy Veggie that's based here in Toronto. They're a plant forward company. They're not trying to be an alternative protein or alternative meat company. They're just focusing on kind of good tasting vegetable products grown from sustainably sourced farms and the company that they actually partnered with Outcast Foods that I mentioned earlier to, to take recycled or upcycled um, cauliflower waste and, and use that as a coating to one of their uh, latest products, which is overly tasty. <laughs> well, that's cool. That strikes me as a good segue to the question of food security. We have a huge challenge of food security around the world. Mm -hmm. And then some of the specific issues that might pertain to specific communities. Any thoughts on how we can address this going forward? It's a huge question. I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure if we can sort of boil it down to a, a podcast answer, but any thoughts around food security that would be pertinent to talk about? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to give you an answer to <laughs> food security, that's for sure. But um, as you said, like it's a highly complex topic and definitely climate change has played a massive part in food security. Increasing the stress and, and, the, and the challenge. Yeah. Well, yeah, and, and what it means to, to various kind of geographies and, and communities in particular. We talk about food security in... Toronto because we kind of walk to one of the grocery stores and we see empty shelves for products that we normally buy and so we say like we've got food security issues because of COVID and the pandemic and and kind of what's gone on with our supply chain sure that 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 is a food security problem but it's also been a much more prolonged issue and a much more deep-seated issue for communities in particular in in you know our north and obviously kind of first nations communities in particular and what food security and in particular the concept of food sovereignty means to those communities is obviously something that has a lot of different factors that, that need to kind of come to play to, to create, you know, appropriate solutions, I think, as much as anything. Yeah, yeah. And as you're talking, one of the things that came to mind was the tremendous stress that the southern latitudes close to the equator are going to be under as the atmospheric temperature goes up. So like the whole of the Southwest United States is going to become more arid. So a lot of the food supply for Canada comes from there. The same is going to be happening in Europe as well. So I think it's not only food security in our current system, like logistics, we have a little problem with, with uh, current COVID, but going forward, like food sovereignty and how you can be sustainable locally is going to be such an important challenge. Agreed. And that's definitely why you know I, I look at you know, opportunities for for localization of food has been critically important and and certainly for people in urban areas you know again kind of coming back to vertical and urban farming opportunities for people in our first nations communities in northern canada you know that that same opportunity applies leveraging you know vertical and, and urban farming technologies to localize food opportunities so they are less dependent obviously on longer supply chains for accessing the, their food i think is going to be something important yeah, I think there's there's definitely been a lot of barriers between First Nations groups in particular and their, their preferred food sources because of regulation and industry that has also come under threat, increasing threat because of climate change as well. So, And also they've been pushed off their original land base where they were harvesting their foods from. Right. And, and you know, it's a complex issue. And again, you know, one of those you know, somewhat divisive issues because, you know, traditional foods for some of our First Nations communities – People in, in kind of traditional Western societies aren't necessarily, you know, au fait with the way they've sourced food in the past. But the interesting thing is that they've, they've always done it in a sustainable manner. And that's always been the kind of difference between, you know, kind of indigenous food practices historically and, and kind of where we find ourselves today with, with our larger kind of more industrialized food system. So I think, you know, localization of food supply is a really important element to food security. And it's interesting, like, because I kind of mentioned before, you can kind of break localization of food down into very small kind of micro parts. Like there's super cool companies doing really small things in this space, like a company called Urban Leaf that's, you know, helping the consumer. Ultimately, like, you know, people living in condos in, in you know, Toronto, New York and Vancouver grow their own food. And maybe it's just tomatoes and herbs and, and those kind of things to start with. But once you start touching and feeling and knowing where your food's coming from and growing your food, then I feel like it's a start to a journey that, you know, people obviously got to move along. So what what is Urban Leaf doing? Are they actually providing the 
equipment yeah, it's, or provide like a grow kit effectively but there's grow kits that's uh, like almost like a curing coffee pod like companies like aero farms basically you know you just put it in kind of does its thing and you get kind of cherry tomatoes out of it. that's that great companies obviously for for people that's time starved but then companies like urban leaf actually allow you to get your hands dirty a little bit and get more in touch with your food and and, and if nothing else, connect people to it, like connect them to That's the whole exactly right. the set of yep. issues involved. What do you think is missing from the discussion of food supply and climate change? Are there any other questions or better questions we should be asking ourselves? Well, I, I think um, soil health is a completely underrepresented component to the conversation. It's, it's something that I think in certain circles is well understood uh, and well known, but I would hazard a guess that the average consumer... In in our world, we kind of always joke around, like, don't call it dirt. It's not dirt, it's soil. Because, yeah. <laughs> like, dirt has this kind of negative you know, connotation, right? So I think the average consumer generally is relatively unaware of how healthy soil can be a component to our climate change story. And certainly the ability for healthy soil to store more carbon, absorb water, and retain water. So, you know, to your point on parts of like southwestern US where they're increasingly getting arid conditions. If we improve that soil health over a period of time, then you know it can store water um, for longer periods of time, obviously, and in, in improve resiliency over, over a period of time. And then you know we get the benefit of climate change, but also you know improving our food system through through better yield, etc. I'll bore you with, with one stat because I think it's a it's a super interesting stat that I'm sure most people don't know. The uh, Commonly quoted number from a group called the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. IPCC. Yep. And so they estimate that by 2030, the global soil carbon sequestration has the technical potential, and I'll use technical as a very important component to this, of about 5.3 gigatons of CO2 per year. So the agricultural equivalent of production of CO2 is somewhere between 5 and 5.8 gigatons of CO2 per year. So at the top end of their estimate, there is a potential for agriculture to be actually net negative, negative. in yes. terms of their emissions. Yeah. And so there's a lot that makes that you know, a very theoretical conversation, but the potential is there. And so as we look at what is the opportunity in climate solutions, Spending some time on our soil, I think, is a, is an important component to that. Yeah, and in, in fact, reflecting back on our our previous discussion of indigenous customs, um, the wonderful three sisters of beans, squash, and corn together make for great soil because right. the corn goes up and becomes the bean stock where the bean goes, and the beans take the nitrogen out of the atmosphere and put it into the soil. And then the squash covers everything to keep it cool. Right. So it's sort of like this complete soil system with these three plants together. Right. And it covers all the bases. And the carbon is also stored in the soil. It doesn't come out. So it's sort of like, wow. And it's just because of how you plant. Yeah. And there's this kind of like, we can make things like cover cropping and rotational cropping very complex, or we can look at what has been done for thousands of years and saying like, we know how to do it. We just need to get back to doing it. We talked about what's missing. What about who's missing from the discussion? Are there people who should be playing a more important role that are currently not participating? Who's missing from this? Well, I, I think to, to our conversation just now, I, I think First Nations people are, are missing from our um, conversation. I think, you know, we... I, we, I have to agree 100%. <laughs> and, and more pervasive than this one too, but... We have a pretty healthy and diverse stakeholder group in the conversation generally as it pertains to climate impacts from farmers to large CPG companies and everyone in between. And I've definitely been part of, you know, a lot of great conversations led by some great facilitators and, you know, great organizations that are bringing all those groups together. So diverse interests in that regard are kind of brought together. But I, I would say from my experience, we, we definitely see an underrepresentation in, in kind of First Nations communities. And I think they need to have a stronger voice in the, in the conversation and discussion. And as, as we said, like leverage their knowledge of how to live in harmonious nature with their land because they, they've been doing it for thousands of years and I think we have a lot to, to learn from you know, his, historical practices. Have you been successful in, in being able to engage them in 
um, some of the work you're doing? Are, are the companies that you're supporting, funding, actually engaging in effective ways? I'm in the process of bringing together um, some diverse stakeholder groups in, in, in that conversation. I've, I've partnered with some people that have already been able to do that. Bronwyn Wilton runs an agri-food and consulting practice out of Fergus. She's kind of run a lot of stakeholder engagement conversations in this space, and I've been able to leverage her expertise in particular in, in this regard. And the one thing that I've, I've spent some time on is looking at some of the First Nations leaders and talking to some of the First Nations leaders about their involvement in, in these conversations and <laughs> probably more pertinent to, to what we were talking about before, their lack of engagement in these conversations and, and seeing how we can kind of help facilitate an increase in, in that dialogue over time, for sure. Now is a good time. In my world of architecture and design, Indigenous input is absolutely required. We, we just cannot work with clients now without some constructive input, which is, I think, really, really important. We've talked a lot about sustainable food systems, challenges, opportunities. We've got somewhere in the order, if we're lucky, of 10 more years before climate change is going to reach a tipping point where there's almost no return. Some people say it's there now, but I'm sort of hoping that we've got some more time. What do you think? Are, are we going to be able to get our act together on the food sustainability side in time? Uh, what? Um, funnily enough, consumers give me hope. I think. Um, I think that's very good. Not many people would say that. <laughs> well, so I, that's I, I very good that. news. Thank you. <laughs> Why is that? I, I think we've seen a, a real fundamental shift in consumer behaviour in in the last two years, and COVID is been a, a challenge obviously for, for all of us and more than a challenge for, for, for a lot of us but it's also um, you know, created you know, some significant kind of fundamental changes in behavior and I think in in, in our food system we've, we've seen a fundamental shift in the way our consumers are demanding sustainability in our food now. I've mentioned the increase in requirements for transparency I think consumers are just now being afforded the ability to make better choices. And I think we're seeing a, a seeming kind of rise up of consumer demand for better outcomes. And so I think that's what gives me hope because, you know, as I, I think I mentioned before, regulation and policy is kind of one thing that's going to enable that. But for, for true fundamental change to occur, it needs to kind of start at the consumer and uh, you know, the rest of the supply chain re will respond accordingly. Further to that, with the notion of consumers giving you hope, what advice would you offer listeners about what they can do to be part of making a difference in meeting these challenges of sustainable food, but also in the challenges of the 21st century imperative, maintaining hope? Yeah, I would say choose sustainable where you can. Um, what does sustainable mean? I would say like identify, if you can, local farms and supplies where you can you know, purchase directly. It's a better outcome for the farmer. Um, cuts out, obviously, the middlemen. They get a better income as a, as a result of that and it's a better outcome for, for you as a consumer generally speaking because you, you know where your food comes from and I, I would say get out there and see where your food comes from like i've got a as i think i mentioned two and a half year old daughter like the most fun that we had last year was taking her strawberry and blueberry picking and apple picking go and talk to farmers and educate yourself about where food comes from and and enjoy it and i think if you you can see food more uh, more than just something that sustains you, but something that you can enjoy. You'll get a better outcome for it. That's great. Finally, I'd like to ask you three rapid-fire questions to wrap up our interview. The first one is, what books related to these issues do you most often recommend or give to people? Okay, well, I, I, I mentioned Call of the Reed Warbler uh, earlier on in, in the um, conversation it's a big book, so um, yeah, prepare yourself for a bit of a journey in that one, but definitely um, a lot of amazing concepts in that book. Um, one that I did just start re reading recently that's a, a little bit lighter, Mark Bittman's latest book is called Animal Vegetable Junk. Um, it's a bit of a history of... of I haven't read it yet, but I've heard about it. Yeah, so it's a, it's a good yeah. one, um, and I can definitely... Uh, your listeners will have to kind of check in with me later about uh, my, my thoughts on it. Yeah. For, for the non-readers, I mentioned kind of the Netflix documentary, kind of Kiss the Ground. But the, the other one that you know maybe a little kind of off off center that I think is is a bit more of a light-hearted look at this concept, but does introduce a lot of very important concepts for those that kind of pay attention is 
Amazon Prime's documentary called Clarkson's Farm. Jeremy Clarkson, more famous for um, the car series Top Gear. Um, oh, right, right. He's a bit of a polarizing yeah. figure generally, yeah. but he, <laughs> he kind of bought a farm and, and ran a farm. And, and this is his experience. He goes yeah. through a lot of concepts and um, I won't kind of give away the ending, but uh, safe, <laughs> safe to say he, he learned a lot <laughs> through, throughout the course of, uh, of trying to uh, make a profit. And, and advised his kid, don't go to the farm. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I have to get those links from you. That, that sounds excellent. Second question, if you had the power to implement one change, one innovation, or one policy in cities around the world that would have the effect of significantly increasing the sustainable food supply and helping cities adapt to climate change, what would it be and why? Okay. Um, can, I, can, I, can I have two? You can do anything you want. <laughs> I'm going to have two concurrent um, You can. Policies. You can. <laughs> so, so, so one is um, I, I would like more broadly implement, more importantly, maintain green belt regions such as we do have around the GTA. I think these are essential in protecting our current farmland and preventing urban sprawl from taking over existing farmland and therefore requiring farmland sprawl into um, other vegetated areas. And, then, you know, it has a big flow-on effect. So that, that would be one area because I, I think the, the Green Belt initiative here is a very important one, um, but it's not. It's been hugely successful too. It has. And, you know, yeah. the maintenance, I think, is and the protection of it, I think, is is imperative at the moment. Obviously, we've started to see a little bit of encroachment, so we need to um, continue to maintain our strength in that regard. And what that means uh, as well, I think that kind of ties into it uh, to some degree is from a city planning perspective, the opportunity and permitting processes for vertical and urban farming needs to be simpler and more efficient. And I think we need to increase the supportive funding from both the public and private sectors in that regard. Uh, and that's certainly commensurate and supportive of density as well. That's, yeah, yeah that makes a lot of sense. Okay, third question if you could publish a full page spread, this is sort of a fun one, a full page spread in the Sunday New York Times or any other paper you wanted, <laughs> of anything you wanted, written or graphic, what would it be? I would have a, a very simple slogan and whatever some smarter person than me, whatever kind of graphic was required, um, <laughs> saying, know a farmer, know your food. <clears throat> oh, that's cool. So I want I want people to focus. You should on probably knowing have that on the bottom from. of your letterhead. I should probably trademark that. Yeah, that's people. fantastic. <laughs> you know what? That would be a great title for this podcast. Noah Farmer, yeah. know your food. Cool. That's awesome. <laughs> Is there anything you would like to ask of our listeners? So they've listened to you. They have a much better idea of sustainable food. What would you like to ask of them going forward? Yeah, I think to that ad, I, I, I'd say I, I want you to know what's in your food, know where it comes from. You know, walk around a farmer's market and talk to those that are producing our food and understand the, the, the process that they kind of got to to kind of put, put food in front of you. And, you know, when you're in a grocery store, look at the ingredients. If you don't know what half of them are, you know, maybe there's a better option for you. Yeah. Or if you can't read them, don't buy it. <laughs> it's unpronounceable. Yeah, right. As Michael Pollan said, don't yeah, buy and it. We've all generally been conditioned to kind of walk through a, a grocery store and, you know, head to the, the areas that we always head to and buy the, the same food that we always buy. And, you know, our, our supply chains have kind of dictated that, you know, food is relatively common in our, in our grocery store. So find the local boutiques in your neighborhood as well that generally kind of stock more local and and certainly more seasonal produce you never know what you're going to get i subscribed probably three and a half years ago to a um, delivery service from a farmer up near bracebridge delivers a box of produce uh, to us once a week and i don't know what i'm getting every week until he, <laughs> he until he sends me the email and you know i'm i'm looking up recipes because i'm like i don't know how to cook this that, that's fantastic and how long between the email you get and the box arriving so you can figure out what to do. Two days. Two days. That's not bad. <laughs> yeah. Funny. And he, he does, you know, provide some, some recipe examples as well. But this concept of I shouldn't be eating, you know, pep, peppers every day, every, you know, kind of grocery shop. I shouldn't be buying strawberries every grocery shop because, you know, you know, while we have greenhouses, obviously, in, in, in Ontario, they're not necessarily, you know, seasonal produce. And, yeah. you know, buying seasonal produce, one, it's, it's better for you because it's, you know, generally kind of more, more nutrient dense um, because it's grown in the right season. And, and, and two, it's, uh, it's more sustainably produced. 
That's great. Can we put the name in the podcast notes of this this company? Yeah, it's called The Stubborn Farmer, which is a great name. That's great. <laughs> and finally, are there any social media links that listeners can uh, tune into on? Yeah, I'm, I'm on LinkedIn from a personal perspective and, and the company. So my LinkedIn tag is BW Gibbons and uh, the, the company is, is waterpoint-lane. And my Twitter handle is at Waterpoint Lane. Wonderful. Okay, we'll get those in the show notes. Ben, thank you very much. This has been a lot of fun and yeah. very, very informative. I've enjoyed it. Thank you very much, Craig. Good to chat. Cheers. You can find links to more information about this podcast and to notes about the books and references we've discussed at tfcipodcast.com. And if you like the podcast, please let us know by rating it on the Apple iTunes podcast website and by sponsoring the podcast on our Patreon sponsor page at patreon.com forward slash TFCI podcast. This podcast is ad free and relies entirely on listener support from people like you. So if you find our podcast interesting and valuable, please consider becoming a patron. Your sponsorship will not only help us cover the cost of production, but we will also be spending 50 cents of every sponsorship dollar to plant trees. To do this, we have formed a partnership with Community Forest International, who will not only be planting seedlings for you, but taking care of them to make sure they continue to grow and absorb carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So please head over to the Patreon page and become a sponsor. Until next time, thanks for listening.